so the topic is uh, Australia's future in the balance, overcoming antagonism and reigniting enterprise and prosperity. Following economic reforms that began in 1983 and petered out around 2003, Australians enjoyed the greatest advance in their living standards since Federation. And I'm just going to provide some factual context for what uh, Wolfgang and Paul will be talking about tonight. And this shows what many economists think is the, the best measure of uh, living standards. It's a bit of a mouthful, but real net national disposable income per capita. But uh, as you can see, uh, we had a tremendous run up there from about 1992 to 2012. Um, and uh, that period, and in that, in that period of 20 years, uh, the increase was 71% in real net national disposable income per capita. And I don't, uh, I don't have all the figures at my disposal, but I suspect that it was the biggest advance in Australian living standards since Federation and, and maybe forever. What was behind the, the, uh, the, uh, at least the first half of this advance in living standards was uh, this uh, growth spurt in what is called multi-factor productivity growth from uh, the early 90s to the early 2000s. But um, the lagged effects of the reforms uh, in the period 83 to 2003 have now subsided and the post-2003 <coughs> upsurge in the terms of trade is being reversed. So just as this uh, growth spurt in productivity uh, petered out, and since then we've had flat to falling multi-factor productivity, just as that stopped, the tremendous advance in the terms of trade started in the about 2003, and that was probably the biggest increase in the terms of trade. Australia has ever had and that is what kept our living standards going up and up until uh, 2012 subject to a brief interruption uh, during the global financial crisis and um, and this is another way of showing that where in the 1980s um, this was the contribution of productivity growth that accelerated greatly in the 90s. Almost all of the increase in per capita income in the 90s came from productivity growth, but then in the noughties, as they're called, uh, productivity growth sank, and the terms of trade came to the rescue and supported the continued strong growth in per capita income. But then there are these projections of what will happen if we go back to uh, if the terms of trade continue falling, as is projected, and productivity growth goes back to its long-run average, then this is what would happen to the growth of uh, per capita incomes in the period ahead. Neither the political elites nor the wider public appear to have come to terms with these new, more sober realities. And this is interesting. It's from the uh, Lowy Institute uh, survey of opinion and it shows the decline in uh, economic optimism about Australia's economic performance in the world over the next five years and uh, the latest observation of those who are either very optimistic or optimistic is uh, the lowest it has been in this period of 10 years covered and interestingly it is lower than it was at the time of the global financial crisis. The policy climate has turned antagonistic, populist and obstructive. In my opinion, uh, it is the worst policy climate I've seen in 40 years. Fiscal discipline has been consigned to the too hard basket and we are about to start the eighth consecutive year of sizeable um, Commonwealth budget deficits, as this graph shows. There is a new emphasis on redistribution of wealth rather than producing it, 
and on short-term demand, demand manipulation instead of policies to enhance the economy's flexibility and bolster its long-term growth potential. In this climate, there is a real risk of a protect, protracted national malaise repeating the trauma of the Whitlam-Fraser era. Now, these fundamental issues and practical policy <coughs> solutions are going to be discussed by <coughs> Professor Emeritus Wolfgang Kasper and Paul Kelly here tonight. And uh, Wolfgang Kasper has just today uh, released his uh, booklet, um, The Case for a New Australian Settlement, Ruminations of an Inveterate, e inveterate Economist. He is the inveterate economist. And uh, happily, these booklets are available for sale uh, out here at the desk tonight. Wolfgang is a professor emeritus in economics uh, of the University of New South Wales Defence Academy. From 99 to 06, he was a senior fellow here at the CIS. After his formative years in post-war Germany and elsewhere in Europe, and with a PhD in international finance, he served as a Harvard advisor to the Malaysian treasurer and joined the Australian National University in 1973. Puzzled by Australia's poor economic growth at that time, he began to argue for all-round liberalisation. He was lead author of the Australia at the Crossroads project, which foreshadowed the economic reforms begun in 1983. Paul Kelly is editor-at-large on The Australian. He was previously editor-in-chief of the paper and he writes on Australian politics, public policy and international affairs. Paul has covered Australian governments from Gough Whitlam to Tony Abbott. He is a regular television commentator on the Sky News program Australian Agenda. And he is the author of eight books, including The End of Certainty on the Politics and Economics of the 1980s. His most recent book, Triumph and Demise, covered the Rudd-Gillard era, and his earlier book, The March of Patriots, offered a reinterpretation of Paul Keating and John Howard in office. So with that, I will welcome first Wolfgang Kasper to the platform to deliver his presentation. Thank you. Wolfgang. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. Friends of the CIS, pleasure to talk to you. The title of this evening's thing was Australia's Future in the Balance. Actually, I don't think so. Uh, I say this at the risk of being labeled a clown by our bonhomie radiating treasure. But if we consider economic growth, we have been drifting downwards. And uh, I think uh, from my understanding of economic, uh, long-term economic development, I'll talk about that, this is the most likely outcome in the next 10 years or so. But the main message I want to leave behind tonight is it is not unavoidable. We can do something about it now. When I served uh, my apprenticeship some 50 years ago as a practicing economist in applied economics with the German Council of Economic Advisers and OECD, I learned that growth measures the change, the increase in the supply of goods and services per capita over the long term. It's not a short term, year to year, quarter to quarter phenomenon. Adjusted for inflation, you take out uh, cyclical, seasonal and weather variations and what you get is something like what you, we have, namely an image that economic growth is never steady. It always fluctuates. Some periods are above a long-term trend, some are below. We know in the case of Australia, if we think about the last 40 years, that in the Whitlam-Fraser years, more than 40 years uh, and uh, 40 years ago, we were below the trend. I was new in the country and probably quite impressionable. 
but I found the policies here amounted to monetary masochism. Macroeconomic policy was toothless. There were weak upswings in the business cycle in that short three to five year cycle. Unemployment was ratcheting up. Inflation was entrenched. There was much discussion about income redistribution. It was not a happy time, at least not from where I was in Canberra. We uh, had another big event that influenced things, which was in the early 80s, the second oil crisis and the wage explosion coinciding and leading to a recession. We then had the famous Keating cleansing or sobering up uh, crisis that we had to have. And more recently, a big event was, of course, uh, Wayne Swan's Spendathon. World record swing from surplus into deficits, and the effects on economic growth were minimal. Big cost, low benefits. Now, if we ab abstract from that, we see that uh, there are periods of deceleration into below trend territory and periods of acceleration a generation or two in to positive above trend growth. An alteration with generation spans or longer over roughly 40 years of negative and then positive surprises for most people. This pattern reflects what economic historians have long studied and documented and what is known in the literature by the name of Kondratiev cycle. A Russian Soviet uh, Marxist uh, statistician who did a lot of work a uh, hundred years ago to study why the capitalist system had these accelerations and decelerations in economic growth. And I must say that Kondratiev understood more about waves than Kelly Slater. And essentially, it's a socio psychological phenomenon. It seems that the public mood, the zeitgeist, as the Germans would say, swing between generations of innovation, youth, reform, the vigor of the market takes over, and then a generation that takes economic growth for granted, things slow down, old uh, untenable uh, socioeconomic positions get defended, political lobbying, worries about income distribution, the rigor of collective controls take over. I'm not inclined to be a Jeremiah, but I think we now, at the present stage, have to think very hard about what if, after we have started to slow down, we have a repetition of the Fraser Whitlam experience. That would mean we'll be a laggard in the next upswing that is possible in uh, till 2025 or so. And I believe also, and that's the main message, that we could be a front runner if we play the things right. What can be done about it? It's, uh, if you do that, you need a theory. We need a theory of economic growth. My study of long-term economic history and my understanding of international comparisons why certain countries have economic growth and others don't runs roughly like uh, this. The literature starts, and uh, I think uh, we heard uh, uh, before, uh, uh, starts with the mobilization of production factors. We're told that economic uh, growth happens when labor and skills are being utilized, when capital and technology is there, and natural resources. But these are only proximate uh, explanations of growth. The immediate question then is, why do some countries in some periods of time employ and develop more skills and others don't? Why do some countries develop natural resources and others die of the fear of fracking. Why won't they do it? <laughs> and the answer to that, that uh, proximate thing is, of course, that behind this is entrepreneurship. That's a general quality in people, and it's not only in businessmen, it's in private people as well. 
of course, there are suppliers, producers who think about new knowledge, new products, new production processes, and they know that it's risky. On enterprise is always risky. Will the market make it profitable or not? And uh, it also is present, for example, in what young people invest in themselves. Do they make themselves skilled ready or prepared to be couch potatoes? Uh, that's also entrepreneurship and quite an important thing. Now, all this is very risky, as I said, and to confine the risk, we must uh, uh, surround uh, the enterprise culture by what the literature calls institutions, trustworthy, enforced traffic rules. And uh, these are the mores, if you want, the reliability, the honesty, the work habits of people, the customs. What in a recent uh, lecture, a uh, Bonaisen lecture, Deidre McCloskey called the bourgeois virtues. And of course, also government-made rules, legislation, administrative regulations, how the courts decide things and interpret matters. In particular, what matters for the economy and economic growth are secure private property rights and the freedom or otherwise of their use. Some talk about economic freedom, others talk about economic growth requires the right economic order. Um, that uh, is a word that is not much used in Australian parlance. But then you have to go on and say, how do these things happen? Uh, it's not the institutions, the economic reforms alone. What really ultimately matters is the shared fundamental values. And this goes beyond mere economics. We have in societies, if we're lucky, shared understandings amongst ourselves that underpin valuable social capital. And good institutions are social capital. They are productive. Uh, it's absolutely key in a dynamic modern knowledge society in service sector uh, production, uh, the sort of economy we now have. Fractures, confused societies tend to fail economically. And uh, societies that become unsure and antagonistic easily uh, start failing in producing more economic growth. Uh, Huntington, Clash of Civilization, talked uh, about the importance of a, an agreed center of social institutional gravity, using his words. I think that's very important. Now, in the publication which uh, um, is being released by the CIS today, I go through these various production factors and ask what are the likely trends and what can politics, collective action, do to improve the supply of these production factors? I won't dwell on these uh, details here. Instead, I want to go right back to these fundamental values, that framework. And the question I want to ask is, could we possibly agree on a new set of fundamental understandings appropriate to a thriving future Australia in the global knowledge economy? This uh, would be very useful, in my opinion. Fundamental agreements of what sort of a country do we really want to leave behind to our children? What sort of a community do we want? After federation, um, such a basic discussion was had and held, and we got, thanks uh, to Paul Kelly's analysis, the Australian settlement certain basic understandings, and for better or for worse, they serve to create a certain policy cohesion for a generation or two and helped Australia's economic development. Of course, we also know that post-1960s, these things became untenable one after the other, and we got the end of certainty. We then had uh, partial economic reforms in the 80s and 90s, which uh, helped us uh, to exploit the China demand and helped us with the China boom. That uh, covered up on the deficiency in underlying shared socio-economic capital that evolved. 
And at the same time, thanks to technological changes, IT revolution, we got m forces of fragmentation, anti-authoritarian consequences that aggravated this lack of basic understandings. And the anti-social media is something new, something I think quite important in what we discuss here. Of course, diversity in social political mores are not only f uh, dangerous and costly, they can be enriching. But if we go beyond a certain <coughs> level of confusion about the principles and about basic values, it increases the entrepreneurial risks of producing in this country, of investing here, and that means slow economic growth. So again, the question, can we subscribe somehow to some fundamental principles which constitute an intellectual and an emotional commitment which should serve in a way as the final stopping point in policy debate. Uh, and I want to uh, put uh, to you a list of five elements. The first, Australia should be, has been and should be continue to be committed to individual freedom self-responsibility tempered by respect for others. Most of us, we, the citizens, should spontaneously oppose proposals uh, that violate our freedom. If it has been established in a debate about uh, a policy proposal that this violates individual freedom, it should be laughed out of court, it should be dismissed. That's what I mean by final stopping point. Another basic principle I think that would serve as well is widespread recognition that we are open to the world. Much progress has been done on this uh, front uh, compared to the old protectionist era 40 or longer years ago. But there are odd remnants that are popping up every now and then. Just give you one example. Australia has much land. We are pretty good in building apartments and houses and gardens. Why do we frustrate this sort of export, which doesn't even <laughs> leave the country, by being xenophobic to well-to-do Chinese and Brits who want to settle here and see out part of their retirement years, enjoy the sunshine, would be good for all sorts of services, uh, medical, tourism, etc. Why do we discriminate against them? Victoria has a discriminatory, uh, how they enforce it, I don't know, discriminatory taxes now against Chinese. Why this emotionalism? This is xenophobia and doesn't uh, fit us well. Let's embrace openness with all the consequences. We should be open to the future. We should laugh out of court defensive lobbying by established groups who were high in the pecking order and who are somehow losing that because they have embraced wrong models of uh, industry uh, production, etc. Let's reject that sort of rent seeking when politicians do it and when lobbyists ask for it. Let's embrace structural change. Everything that grows changes the structure. A tree that grows, a child that grows into uh, manhood or womanhood uh, cho uh, changes the structure. Let's remove the obstacles for innovators. I know many people who want to test new ideas, but I can tell you that the people I talk to are not motivated to do it or leave it by a quarter of a percentage point interest rate cut. That doesn't trigger enterprise, although hockey tried to make us believe that the other day. They are hindered by occupational health and safety, by environmental regulations, etc., etc. I know a case of a South Coast prawn farmer. I had a very good project, the science all sorted out. He had achieved one dozen permits, licenses from local governments, state governments, federal authorities, cost him much treasure, nerves, much time, but then there was more coming and vexatious labor market regulations. So he just gave up. That's the problem with innovation and being open to the future.
How many permits did Gina Reinhardt need uh, when she talked the other day about her new mine? It's preposterous. All governments, of course, talk about war on paperwork. They always promise us that. But then they allow the lobbies and the bureaucrats to inflate the regulatory burden. And I want us to tell everyone <laughs> red tape kills, kills private enterprise. Let's streamline, let's remove the contradictions, make it simple. Let's go to one-stop shops. Unfortunately, some Australian states have introduced one-stop shops, but it turns out it's one more stop shop. <laughs> <laughs> the next one I want to talk about is government. I want us to discuss whether we shouldn't have a small, modest, competing and secular government of a purer form than we do. When I say small, I think we should cut back to 25, maybe 30 percent of total demand. That's what it was in the Menzies era, that's what it is in East Asia. Why not? I want us to be modest about it. We used to have modest members, but that's a while ago. Politicians should stop over-promising, especially on welfare, Governments cannot deliver, we know that. And NGOs, lobbyists, the media, voters should know big government is bad government, it's failing government. And we then, as a consequence, get big disappointments and disillusionment with democracy, not good. I want governments in Australia to be competitive. We have to rethink federalism. The Australian model of federalism, which is very centralized, is the last remnant, the last monument to that great Australian handout tradition. It's redistributionist and leads to irresponsibility. Canberra taxes, the states and local governments, mostly they do some taxes, avoid the opprobrium of taxation and then get funds by posturing, by lying, and by hindering economic growth. It's just undignified how these uh, premiers' conferences are conducted. We need uh, devolution of powers where uh, government functions can be done best. The technical word is subsidiarity, which is the essence of what is called competitive federalism, to end the cartel of what we now have of big taxing, big spending governments. The technical term again that I want to throw in here is fiscal equivalence. Each government is allotted, assigned certain tasks and raises the taxes to fulfill these uh, <coughs> tasks as they see fit in competition which is with each other. Some may promise less and tax less, others may try to have gold plated uh, street lights and uh, taxes a bit more. Uh, the newly minted member of uh, Parliament, Peter Hendy, has some very good ideas about this sort of thing as a basis for economic reform in this country out in the media. I wholeheartedly uh, uh, support that. Once governments are responsible for raising their own funds from the taxpayers, they will be interested in growing the tax base, in cultivating the tax base. Just give you an example of, uh, in my imagination how things could happen. Imagine that local governments got a share of uh, the mining revenue in their district. Can you imagine what would happen if a uh, local government would uh, write to the electorate and say, should we allow fracking in our district and you get a 20% rate cut? Or should we ban fracking forever and your rates will increase this year by 7% and like that uh, in the future, it will, they will double in 10 years' time. I bet you Lismore will get cracking fracking. <laughs> if the states are responsible for raising their own resources, I bet you they will find big savings that now we are told are impossible to find. We know the welfare state is broke. We know that the centrally controlled government monopoly in delivering education, health, public housing, etc., uh, administered by cumbersome, risk-averse, uh, 
uh, administrations and dominated frequently by entrenched public sector unions has become unaffordable. This is another factor, I think, an important one in the disaffection in this country and in European countries with democracy. If you are interested in these things, uh, the CIS is, I recommend to you the Swedish experience, reforms about 10 years ago with charter schools that had to start competing for school vouchers. The uh, uh, quality of teaching went up enormously and good teachers really started to like it. Um, with hospital care, I find inspiring material in these trust hospitals in Spain and in the UK. Great savings, great quality improvements, the mobilization of creativity, diversity, different communities need different types of service, the great mobilization of local voluntary resources. People like to volunteer, they like to be engaged, and that's good for democracy. I want the government uh, to be uh, secular. The European wars of religion have taught us that the separation of church and state is essential, absolutely essential for social peace. And we must expect all immigrants to commit to this, otherwise they don't fit in here. Last point, we have been and should be absolutely clear that we want to continue to be part of Western civilization. Australia is exposed here. We are an outrigger in the Asia-Pacific uh, region, the frontline state. We need strategic clarity on that. And I think we should acknowledge that we are becoming a multiracial country. That's fine. That's probably a potential asset. But we should admit that this doesn't mean that we become a multicultural country. That leads to fractiousness and destruction. And that means that whilst we need substantial immigration, I believe, to increase the labor force and all these things, we should be selective about who we admit here. We should welcome those who fit in, um, and we can judge that uh, maybe uh, by crude uh, assessments of workforce participation, intermarriage rates, incarceration rates, because if we ignore these things, the skills base in Australia will suffer. That's bad for economic growth. The welfare evidence will explode. And essential social capital will deteriorate further. And that's bad. And this is this uh, list of uh, five elements together is what I mean by a new Australian settlement. Getting there is not easy. Recent trends uh, in economic freedom have not been encouraging. They point, to my mind, to a Kondratiev downturn, to a slowdown, to an economic uh, crisis. We have been backsliding in the world on economic freedom. There were mass massive improvements, Thatcher, Reagan, the fall of the Soviet Empire, the China revolutions that have triggered in the world at large, according to this analysis, of the world, of uh, about 160 countries on average. And that has triggered the golden growth era of the 1980s and 90s. It's now stalling. The US used to be the benchmark, uh, started to lose ground massively under Bush's compassionate conservatism and uh, the engagement in costly wars without concern for the budget. Isn't that a bit reminiscent of uh, Tony Abbott sometimes seems to think? And more recently, of course, we have had Obama's big society interventionism, and now Clinton evokes Roosevelt, heavens forbid. And so the US is not encouraging to be re become a leader again. In Australia's history, we had the Whitlam shock, which grossly uh, diminished economic freedom and uh, stimulated inflation. That had to do with that uh, slowdown in economic growth in the 70s and up to 83. We then had the partial reforms by Hawke-Keating. They had holy cows. Uh, 
labor markets, big welfare were in touch, but they were pretty good reforms otherwise. And then it was followed by partial reforms in the Howard Costello era. The budget got sorted out, partial labor market reforms, and that accelerated that upswing in economic growth that we all found so inspiring. More freedom allowed Australian producers to meet the China demand. Our boom became the envy of the Europeans. And the boom was not a God-given thing. We earned it. If you know these export industries, they competed successfully against other producers of coal and iron ore, and they were free to do that. In the late Howard era, uh, progress on economic freedom started, and we know that the Rudd-Gillard backsliding on labor markets, government deficits, did great damage. I have inserted here a, a figure for the year 2014. Internationally available figures are not there, but I know the methodology, and my best guess is there. And I only wish that the Abbott Hockey Administration were not so clueless about economic freedom. It matters. Demand manipulation won't do it. Easy money, a bit of public spending, a mini tax cut here or there is not sufficient to power up the supply side. Now, I know when I speak like that, I'm at variance with the uh, model builders uh, that dominate the Treasury, with Keynesian bureaucrats who see power in manipulating the levers of the economy. But I find myself uh, in agreement with many business leaders and elder citizens with whom I occasionally talk. Let me allow one short final point. Growth is a long-term supply-side phenomenon. We cannot take the underlying economic order for granted. It needs regular, conscious cultivation. In my career moving around the world and looking at success stories, I found time and again that economies that had an advocate for economic freedom at the supply side, at the cabinet table, were successful. Grub in post-war Germany, where order liberalism, as they called it, created a very quick recovery and uh, record job creation. It was not an economic miracle. It was good policy, good philo philosophy. I discovered the same thing in the Asian tiger countries. I would invite you uh, to take a book out of the most successful growth success story in the Eurozone, which is Spain. In the last three years, they have had a minister of the economy and competitiveness who is a very forceful voice at the cabinet table for long-term prosperity, freeing up labor markets, capital, natural de resource development. We are now facing, whether we like it or not, a new era of free trade with all these free trade and investment agreements. If we don't have something like that, and I would propose a Department of Economic Affairs or something that draws in the Productivity Commission, trade, industry, industrial relations, that uh, argues for making the supply side flexible and fo fosters economic freedom, if we don't do that, the juggernaut of free trade from the US, Japan, Korea, China, etc., globalization in general, will destroy jobs in this country. We'll be sitting there like rabbits in the glare of headlines. Free trade and free investment is an opportunity, but we have to prepare for it. It's not automatic. And I see too little realization on that. If we remain rigid and defensive, we'll prolong the era of disappointment and misery. And all this, what I'm saying here, it goes beyond economics. It's a moral issue, ultimately. Th we can't leave it to politicians because they are too short-termist, too opportunistic. <sighs> Maybe they, dare I say it, lack the courage and the candle power to understand these things. I don't know. We need a national debate may be initiated by groups of experienced leaders who could argue for a new settlement, could the pros and cons of what I'm proposing here, and foster an understanding in our society what it takes to make for prosperity and freedom. Thank you. <laughs>